Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I'm deeply honored to, to be here today, and um, I want to get started first with giving a little bit of context, some personal context. My great-grandfather, as an, an American, I'm like so many Americans, I have some roots in Sweden. My great-grandfather would be horribly pleased and proud to see me here today as he was when he was wearing his Swedish garb on the house he built in Iowa. Um, so it, it has a personal touch for me as well. And to give a little bit more context as well, the CGAR, uh, I think many of you are familiar with it. It is a, a system of 15 international research centers uh, around the world working on different commodities, focused on improving productivity and now also food security, and improved environment in developing countries across the world. And the International Livestock Research Institute, where I work, it has the mandate for livestock, but a couple of the other centers also contribute forage uh, research and also research on small ruminants, and they're part of the program that I lead that consolidates the capacity across the CGIR together with the partnership with SLU. Again, in terms of context, our focus is on smallholder livestock production. It's not on the whole livestock s sector across the world or in the developing country. It's really on, right now, where most of the food comes from, animal source food comes from in the developing world. And th some people think that smallholder livestock production is sort of a romantic idea of the past. It's not, it's still the reality. It's still producing the great share of animal source food and in the developing world and will have to be the source of animal source food for the growing populations and the growing income-led demand for animal source food in the developing world. Those systems are very complex. They're very diverse. Uh, they they ha address very different scales from large pastoralist herds to the small backyard chicken type of operation. And the important thing for this talk is to recognize that they are not just a production activity, that the livestock in the developing world has multiple uses, multiple roles, multiple degrees of importance to the families, the households that keep the livestock. Producing food for the, the household itself is one aspect as well as selling the product, the normal commercial activity. But also hugely important is the manure that's produced is the major reason why fertility can be maintained for crop production across the developing world. Also, it's the main agricultural farm equipment that farmers have uh, in terms of providing the power for plowing, for transport. It's the, it's the pre-tractor um, equ equipment. Also, what is not recognized is the role they play as financial instruments. Many households don't have access to banks. So livestock become their banks on the hoof. Also, they're an insurance policy. People really rely on livestock for paying school fees, for when there's a medical crisis in their household, it's the livestock that gets sold to, to cover that. And when there's a drought or when there's a, uh, a major catastrophe, it's the livestock that they, they rely on. And finally, in some areas, enhance, it's very important for social status. Um, sometimes you can't get married if you don't have a cow. And how important are they? I mean, these are just a couple of figures that, and these are crude estimates, but estimates that we go by that are supported by, by different pieces of evidence. 70% of the world's rural poor still rely on livestock. It's an important part of their livelihood. Some three quarters of a billion poor livestock keepers um, are keep, are, exist in the world, and two thirds of those are women. It's, livestock are hugely important as often the only asset that women have access to. Even if you don't have land, you can earn some income from live, livestock because they're mobile. They don't require land necessarily. 
And so even 100 million landless people rely on, on livestock. Important for this talk, it's not just the production value of the livestock. 40% of the overall value are non-tangible uh, types of, of benefits, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those, especially the insurance and financing aspect. As I said, manure is very important. It comprises over 70% of the soil fertility amendments made in the, in the lowest income countries. And it offers much employment, just like in Sweden over the previous 200 years, it was an important part of rural society and, and provides income. Now, in terms of health, what is important, for, again, for this talk is that health is really the major constraint that livestock keepers in these systems face, health to their animals. This is just a chart from some recent work in, in East Africa where we, we evaluated what was the gain from an intervention to improve dairy production in a smallholder system. And you can see genetics. Yes, I'm sorry for the previous speaker. Genetics is important, but, and feed is important. Management and, and reproduction is important, but it's health that really produced the gain in these systems over a four-fold uh, increase in productivity once you improve the health. Now, where does the, the name of my talk, Vetonomics, it doesn't exist, I made that up, okay, just, just to be sure. Um, wh where does that come in? Well, as you saw in the last slide, there's a huge gap that can, where you can improve productivity through improved health. But that's a persistent gap. We've had veterinary sciences over the last 100 years has made huge advances in the ability to control diseases in developed countries. But in developing countries, we don't see the same gain. And that's, that's the vetonomics. What the problem has been, and this is a, a bit of a flippant um, overgeneralization, but veterinary paradigms that work in the north are irrational in the South. They don't apply and fit the needs of the problems and the systems and the people who make decisions in the South. It's assumed that the livestock systems in developing countries are the same as in developed countries. Same context, you just have to, it's just portable, you bring in the same strategy, apply it, and everything will be good. We've tried again and again and again, and it doesn't work as, as smoothly as expected. And part of this is the lack of recognition that those livestock have other roles than just a commercial production activity. And because of that, people make decisions in different ways. So combining veterinary epidemiology with a dose of economics has proven very powerful to be able to begin to understand why veterinary strategies have not been as effective as we would have expected. I had the opportunity to work as part of a team in the ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute Epicenter, that's what we called it, a little tongue in cheek there, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Brian Perry, who's an alumnus of, of the same uh, award. He received it uh, four years ago. He, under his leadership, we began applying epidemiology together with economics to really address the issue of how do you improve decision making about veterinary interventions, about where you focus your veterinary work. That meant understanding better how livestock keepers make their decisions, because they're the ones ultimately who have to implement improved health and it's providing better and more appropriate information to the decision makers who make the investments in, in veterinary interventions. Again, combining economics with epidemiology. So I want to give you some examples of what I mean by the irrationality of, of the veterinary paradigms from the north and how we've been beginning to try to address these and, and adapt them more appropriately to the south. 
The first category is just simply how we, do we value livestock and livestock losses and how do we do that more appropriately. The standard approach has been what we apply in most countries is you take the losses from a disease and you multiply that by the, the market price of the livestock. And that's your cost of the disease. A disease that only loses uh, $100 million in a year is obviously lower priority than one that loses a billion dollars in a year. But that misestimates the value for smallholder livestock keepers. It ignores those other multiple roles. It misestimates the value in terms of either underestimating the value of the livestock because of these other roles, or in some cases we found the veterinary science is the way we apply it. We overestimate by uh, taking a disease, when you take the individual diseases and add up their losses, it actually uh, it represents four to five times the population of the livestock that exist in the, in the country. So there's some problems with, with just bean counting and understanding the size of the problems. A particular challenge for zoonosis where we have to combine human health impacts with production impacts where you can put a dollar value, but human health impacts, very hard to put a dollar value to. So it's hard to compare them. As two examples uh, of this misestimation, uh, we were able to show that herders do consider these other uh, functions of the livestock when they make their decisions about, about their livestock. And this is the only economics that you'll see in the, in the presentation is this graph. This is just a standard economic analysis of when should you sell your cow. So the bottom lines are the sale price as the cow grows over years, it increases in value and that's what you can sell the cow for. The other three lines are what is the cumulative value if you kept that cow and kept it longer, kept feeding it, and sold it later. And when they intersect is when you should sell. So the green, is, the green circle is where we normally sell. Farmers will raise beef cattle, they sell them before they get fully grown, and um, that's when it's economically optimal. But when you take into account that keeping the cow, also it provides an insurance and a savings function for the, for the farmer, then you start moving toward the yellow and the red circles and you keep the cow longer. And the more risk you face, whether it's animal disease, epidemics, whatever, uh, the more it is in your interest to keep that cow longer as an insurance policy. That's been important because everybody has looked at the decisions of herders to say, well, why, why do you keep the cow, cows that long? Um, it's irrational. It's totally rational. It's, it makes sense. And this, this is how you need to understand their, their decisions. Similarly, with the cost of foot and mouth disease to cattle keepers in Zimbabwe, when we assessed the impact of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in smallholder farms, the standard approach was just to consider the milk losses and the reduced weight. These are indigenous cattle. FMD, they get sick. It's like having the flu for a couple of weeks. They have very low milk production. Uh, it's not really a, a big impact on their weight. It doesn't really, it's negligible as, a, as an impact, unlike in our systems here in Sweden where foot and mouth disease has a huge impact on, on dairy production. The conclusion would be you don't need to make an intervention in, for those households, for those cattle. But when you realize that the farmers rely on those cattle for plowing their fields, if the cattle are sick at the time of plowing, that household can only plow a much reduced area of land. Knock on effects in terms of food security for the household, et cetera, et cetera. Once you value that in, all of a sudden it becomes much a, high, a higher priority to target an intervention that would make sure those cattle are, are healthy during the plowing season. Just a, a different calculus in identifying the priority. So again, so what from these two examples? 
Based on the standard approach, policymakers would give lower priority to what would be appropriate disease control for, for those kind of households. A second category of irrationality is understanding who benefits from disease control. And this is an example where we assessed a, a policy in, the, in Zimbabwe where they gave priority to foot and mouth disease control through a system of building fences. My colleague, President Trump, would be proud. They actually did build fences that protected large areas of Zimbabwe that did not allow cattle to move in between the areas. So the areas where FMD, foot and mouth disease, was endemic, those cattle were not allowed to have access into farms where they were pr protecting uh, the cattle from FMD. Now it happened, also they had to protect from buffalo, which also um, the wild buffalo could carry the, the FMD. This happened to protect the high value commercial farms uh, of the rich and the communal areas were, were where FMD was left to be endemic. The, uh, the British wanted to invest in something that would improve the livelihoods of people in, in Zimbabwe, and they commissioned us to assess what would be the value of, of improving that FMD control. So we, we began to look at that, and what the argument was that, the veterinary argument was that this is a transboundary disease, it's imperative that you control it. I mean, vets, Vets, their, their purpose in life is to, you know, stamp out disease, is to combat disease. And so it's just, it's normal that you would have to control it. Any investment is, is required, you have to make it. And it would benefit the whole economy because this would promote also export trade and increase the value of the cattle in the country. The analysis that we did, the single largest impact of FMD was in terms of trade bans of the export to, to the EU, they had a special facility, and not the productivity losses to the people who, who actually kept the cattle. And in the end, it was the highest income decile who received over two-thirds of the benefit of this investment. So the veterinary intention was good, but the, the benefit was going to make the rich richer and not really benefit who the investment was targeted to. Another point uh, in terms of irrationality is there is a tradition in veterinary sciences to get the number, dollar number figure for what is the total cost of a disease. How many animals in the world die from a disease and multiply it by the price? And that's your justification for investment, for getting a research grant or getting um, a development grant. That may be very appropriate for long-term research where you want to tackle the big problems that you might not have solutions for, but it makes absolute nonsense for the, for the shorter term, uh, and especially for actual disease control interventions. The more relevant question is how much disease can be avoided and at what, what cost, cost-benefit analysis. It's incredible how across the literature there's just a simple paradigm that it's the biggest, the biggest uh, problem that you should focus on. And this came evident in a major investment in Africa to eradicate setse fly, which transmits the trypanosomosis, the, the biggest disease of cattle uh, in, across Africa. Because it is the biggest problem, it's estimated five billion losses a year in Africa, it was argued that this is a political necessity and a priority. And it led to the creation of the Pan-African Setse and Trypanosomosis Eradication Campaign. This was based on the demonstrated proof that they could eradicate the Setse fly from the island of Zanzibar. Now, I don't know if you've been to Zanzibar, but it takes about 20 minutes to cross the island. It's not a big island. Zanzibar, Africa. Zanzibar, Africa. It's just a different, a different scale. Um, there was a huge scientific debate about whether this was technically feasible, and in the end, the true cost of doing this campaign was ignored. The result, 
bad decision making, and there was a huge loss of scarce resources. Um, countries took out huge loans, $100 million loans, to do this program, and in the end, it, it hasn't made very much progress. Now, we had the opportunity to apply these lessons in being commissioned to do a ranking of what are the important diseases to the poor. And it was, it was really pulling together these different lessons into a, a single exercise where we were able to rank what were the livestock health pro problems that really had an impact on the poor, taking into account all these multiple roles that, that livestock take, and then matching them to what do we know are the potential solutions or how close are we with research to getting to those solutions and prioritizing how much we could actually benefit and avoid uh, animal health losses um, through, through the research. And that we were able to arrive at, a, at, I think, a more reasonable and rational set of research priorities. One last category is understanding livestock keeper incentives. This is an area where we're still working. My wife, Delia Grace, is leading work on food safety that is looking at the same kind of issues. The standard approach is you set veterinary regulations and they will comply. The farmers will comply. It works in Sweden. Why not everywhere else? The other thing is that if it's a good practice, of course, if it improves my bottom line as a farmer, I will adopt it. The reality is that, number one, you cannot enforce regulation in most countries of the South. And number two, livestock keepers have other calculus. They, they make their calculations differently. And the, what we think is the bottom line may be quite different from what, how they're considering it. We saw this in the, in the case of promoting uh, biosecurity for African swine fever. African swine fever is, is now uh, raging across many parts of Africa. You, you've seen in the news it's reached China. But it's, in Africa, it's been there for many years. And the, um, we, we've tried testing, improving the biosecurity on farm so that we can reduce the transmission and the continuing epidemic as it rolls between farms, applying things such as restricting access by visitors, using foot baths, burying infected carcasses six foot deep, and encouraging farmers to report any cases to the veterinary services, something that would be normal practice here in Sweden. Most pig keepers will not comply with that. Number one, you don't report a suspected case to the veterinary services. They come in, they call your, all your herd, you get no compensation, it's a total loss. If you're a smart guy, you sell off your pigs as soon as you suspect a little bit of an outbreak. The traders know it, they reduce the price, the economy works. The market works it out, all that gets put into the, into the, into the market. But it rolls out the epidemic even farther. The other practice is, it's just too much investment. Burying a carcass six foot deep, nobody's going to do that. Almost all carcasses are going to be consumed. Um, we saw the same thing with avian influenza. Chickens are rarely destroyed. Even when they're infected, they're, they're going to end up on the table. The last uh, example is promoting backyard chicken vaccination. Newcastle disease is um, the major killer of chickens in backyard systems across Africa, Asia. There's vaccine that's available, thermostable. It's easy to produce locally and it's cheap. There are projects that have been promoting this. When there is a project, it's taken up and it works very nicely. As Soon as the project stops, it's gone. It doesn't continue even if the vaccine is there. It's not, it's not being subsidized. It, it isn't continued. We need to understand that for most backyard farmers, keeping chickens is a no input and you get something for free output system. Why would I start investing and just divert my attention from my other household activities for something that's working just fine, even if I have 50% of my chickens are lost each year? 
Um, it doesn't take too much um, to, to understand. So summing up, simple extension of the northern veterinary paradigms to the majority of smallholder livestock systems in the, in the lower income countries just misses the mark. We, we haven't hit and gotten it rationalized yet. We have begun to unpack the differences and to help improve veterinary decision making for targeting those systems, but we're still in early days. We really haven't turned a corner on that, uh, the tipping point to really influence uh, veterinary policy the right way. And the effort clearly requires an interdisciplinary role. This is something where economics really had something to, to contribute on the veterinary side. Unfortunately, there are very few people in this area. Very few. I, you can count the number of people on, on your hands. My plea would be for SLU to continue to support and, and encourage the research that's focused in this area and produce the next generation of economists and, and veterinarians who can work together to really solve this, this um, very hard uh, problem in, in the developing country. Thank you.